a derelict sports ground, hemmed in by trains and traffic, vulnerable to vandalism and invasive flora. Not an ideal place for a wildlife haven, perhaps, but there are plans afoot. We want to create a, a pond um, uh, with a dipping platform. Uh, we've got a huge task to plant hundreds of trees to, to buffer the site from the road. So new gates and access, um, new fencing, dealing with all the dereliction. The site is part of a master plan to help transform Bristol's green credentials. We haven't just randomly bought this site. We've bought it because it's very high profile and it is a brownfield site where you can demonstrate that you can create really wonderful habitats for wildlife. And we're putting quite a bit of pressure on ourselves to get the, the infrastructure done so we can open this early in, in 2015 and open it you know, as part of celebrating Bristol being European Green Capital. So it's a huge yeah, challenge. Absolutely. They can't just sit back and expect the wildlife to move in. It will cost big money and require hundreds of volunteers that over the next few months all 12 acres will be dug up, pulled down, cleared and replanted. At the height of summer, the site looks pretty green and lush, but just under the surface lies a surprising link to a darker period of Bristol's history. So in order to understand what we can do in different places on site, we've had to do um, soil sampling. Unfortunately, we always knew that the site was used to dump the spoil from the Blitz in the Second World War. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's virtually the whole site and it's about four metres deep with rubble like this. It's an important feature, so we want to recognise that and there's going to be a memorial on the site for the women that ran Bristol okay. um, during the Second World War while the men were away fighting. Oh, what a lovely idea. Ultimately, it's hoped the reserve will link several footpaths in and around the gorge. Right now, though, there's a main road in the way. So this is one of the biggest challenges of the whole project, is that this is where the public footpath that comes through the site ends and you're right onto a 50 mile an hour highway uh, and unfortunately just about 30 meters down there is uh, the other uh, footpath that should connect and then goes down to the river so you can walk along the Avon River uh, so we need to work closely with the council and try and get a crossing in here and have some traffic calming um, because it's a real shame this whole landscape could be reconnected for people to explore and use. For all the site's challenges, it's an ideal home for slow worms. This is what we've been after. We're looking for sort of presence or absence of these guys on the site, and it's brilliant that we've got them here. Um, they're a European protected species. This sort of site here where there's lots of rubble and tarmac, it stays nice and warm. You've got that sort of latent heat from the stones that last throughout the day. Um, there's a fantastic opportunity to forage for food here. So they're really happy here. While the site's being transformed, the slow worms are carefully rehoused behind a specially built fence. There, they can hibernate safely over the winter. Indications are that we've got good populations here, so um, you know that's a, it's a, it's a real it's a real bonus for the trust. It's a real being. Yeah. Would you like to have a hold? Yeah. Take him. He's warming up in our hands now, so he's gonna he'll get quicker and quicker, but we yeah. can just release him back as soon. He's, he still feels actually quite cold. Yeah. But it's wonderful to think that um, even in a even on a site like this, that's effectively a bit of wasteland that's been, that's been left, you've got this wonderful, really attractive little bit of wildlife. And he's gonna have a great new home in the future. Yep. Some residents are considerably less welcome. So what have we got here? So yeah, this is a Japanese knotweed. Um, uh, and yes. as the name suggests, it's a, it's a non-native, it's an invasive species. Um, and it is a bit of a problem for us on this mm. site right now. So, so it'll stop the other plants flourishing where this is. I mean, you know, yeah, it's certainly will get rid of it. Have you? Yeah, it's very important, really, with knotweed that none of this stuff leaves the site. It's um, even a small piece of the plant. If it's taken off in soil or rubble or something, it can regenerate itself somewhere really? else. So, it's um, it's a, it's pretty hazardous, really, um, and we need to really get on top of it and get it get it under control. Yeah. Elsewhere, a perfect examples of nature just doing what it does best. This looks a lot more like, I guess, a classic meadow. Talk me through it. Yeah, well, we're kind of on the margin of what was the old sports ground here. So 
this part of the site would, wouldn't have really been probably subject to any fertilizer and probably the mowing, mowing regimes are completely different. So the species structure in here is completely different. The grasses aren't so dominant and you've got a lot more color and there's more opportunity for our sort of, um, for the invertebrates and our sort of uh, pollinators as well. Although the wild flowers and slow worms come free with the site, the reserve will only become a reality if the Avon Wildlife Trust can raise enough money to do the work. I'm pleased to inform you that Viridor Credits Environmental Company will support the project and project activities up to the value of £66,885. This money is crucial because we wanted to raise 120,000 to develop the site, but this is, yeah, this is the bulk of everything we need. Last time I was here, back in the summer, this place was rather derelict and unloved. Now the work's begun in earnest to transform it into a nature reserve fit for the European green capital. For a start, there's nearly a mile of fencing to replace to defend against fly tipping and travellers. The derelict buildings have been crushed and made into paths for wheelchair access. So this is where our um, volunteer cabins are going. The yellow markers sort of show the footprint of it with a view all the way down the site. And whilst it will be quite a basic building, there's a canopy where the, the wood for the canopy has been taken out of one of our other nature reserves and designed into that are all sorts of nooks and crannies for bats to uh, uh, sleep in and, and, and all sorts of little features like that. Winter's the perfect time to plant the thousands of trees which will be essential to the new reserve. Luckily, they've managed to attract a host of willing workers. Volunteers are playing a huge part in creating this reserve. In February alone this year we've had 500 people register uh, to volunteer with us from all sorts of walks of life, uh, which is fantastic. You just literally wind it around. Today they're aiming to plant 200 of the trees. Make that 201. Good times when you're tired, instead of like being at home, being lazy and everything, you can have like this to do and you get stuff out of it as well, so. Yeah. Is this going to give you green fingers or are you going to be planting trees at home? I hope so. Um, if not at home, somewhere else or do more stuff like this elsewhere. It's been good, it's fun. That's great. And, and, and what about you? I mean, this is all part of Green Capital. Is Green Capital making you get involved in more stuff like this? Yeah, I love it. The important thing is, I think, we're just trying to inspire people to do their bit where they live as well. So whether it's something in their back garden or at their school or their community centre, you know, our vision is to make Bristol one big nature reserve, so that'd be amazing. Yeah, excellent. And all those people beeping their horns, I like to think they're kind of honking for, for nature and, and giving us honking some support. Honking for nature, I love it. <laughs> Honk for nature, all right. The nature reserve officially opens in April and I'll be back to see how my little tree's getting on. <laughs>